posted this photo to Instagram a few weeks ago and it got so much attention that even Parks Canada reached out and left a comment asking to share the photo. But like any good Lightroom edit, this photo is full of a bunch of tricks. Given the fact that so many of you left comments on this photo, I figured I'd use this video as an opportunity to break down the entire Lightroom editing process from start to finish. Before we get started, I will say that this video is timestamped. So if you wanna jump ahead to learn about a specific feature, or if you wanna go back to review something, you can definitely do that. But I will say it's gonna be best for you to watch this from start to finish so that you understand the whole process and why it's important to make certain edits before you jump ahead to make other types of edits. Right away we see that I'm working with a drone photo. This was taken with a DJI Air S2. And in order to get this formatted for Instagram, I'm actually gonna need to take my crop tool and get this to a four by five aspect ratio because that's how you can fill as much space as possible on Instagram. Clicking that, that's the wrong orientation. So I'm gonna hit X on my keyboard to get that flipped around. And I'm just gonna reposition it slightly so that I get the river right in the center there. Now the other tool you may wanna use is if your photo's not perfectly level, you can come in here, you can either hit auto and Lightroom will try to guess and straighten your photo, or more often than not, I'll grab this straighten tool and drag a line all the way across my horizon just to get a slight adjustment to make sure that my photo is perfectly level. The very next thing you should do is jump down to your white balance. In this case, I'm gonna try and make this photo a little bit cooler because I think it's a bit too warm. 5500 is perfectly neutral daylight. So if you're shooting on a summer day with no clouds, just know that that is kind of even white balance. Of course, you can also jump in here and match it to certain types of lights. If you're shooting indoors, maybe there's tungsten lights in the background. Or in my case, I'm just gonna set it manually to 4500 and take this down a little bit because I want it to be a bit more green, negative 11 looks good. Also, I recommend setting exposure at this point because all the edits you make from here on out are gonna depend on where the colors and where the shadows and where the highlights are. So it's very important that you get that set correctly the first time. In this case, I'm just gonna brighten it up just a tad so that we can get more detail out of the shadows down here. Contrast, I'll typically leave alone, and that's because if you jump down to the Presence tab and then later the Tone Curve, there are better ways to set contrast, including using radial and gradient filters to set contrast just within a small portion of your image. So for now, we're gonna leave contrast at zero. Now that's something at the end of your edit, you could always come back just to boost the contrast overall. The majority of the time, I just completely leave that feature alone. Since we've got our exposure set generally correct, I tend to jump down to the lens corrections and transformations. Now this photo, because it's with the DJI Air S2, all of the lens corrections are done inside of the camera. So if I turn it on, it doesn't have any effect. But if you were shooting with a kit lens and maybe there's a bit of vignetting, that's the dark ring you get around the outside of your photos, you could come in here, you could select your camera and your lens type and Lightroom knows to automatically remove both the vignetting and chromatic aberration. Now chromatic aberration, it's gonna be hard to see with this photo, but in some photos like around the edges of trees or where you have a dark spot and a light spot, it's kind of that color fringing you get. So coming in here and clicking that will remove any of that color cast that you're getting. In terms of any transformations, one thing I would say is that I typically do not touch those unless I'm doing interiors or architecture photography. And that's because typically you want things like your building to be nice and straight or your furniture to be nice and level. With landscape photography, as long as your photo is straight, it doesn't matter so much. And in fact, making those types of adjustments can actually soften the pixels in your photo because what Lightroom is doing is it's taking your pixels and kind of stretching them a little bit. And so the end result is that your photo will be a little bit softer and not as sharp as when you originally shot it but you can definitely use those. It's a great way to save a photo that's maybe not perfectly straight, but in 90% of the time, I just leave those completely alone. Of course, if you do use those features or if you just wanna add some sharpness in general, you can jump to the detail tab and typically I will add a little bit of sharpness, which you can remove it or you can add it depending on how much you want. Uh, let's just say 50. Now, if you jump down here to masking and you actually click and drag it and hold alt, you can see how the sharpness is affecting the 
image. So if you mask it off more and more, you can see that, you know, it's kind of creating it just on the edges of the trees versus, you know, if I go back down to where we started, it's affecting the whole image. Now, be very careful depending on what you're shooting, especially if you're shooting portraits. If you go too crazy with the sharpness, it can really start to make your subject look artificial. So I will typically reserve using this feature on things that aren't a human subject. So landscape photography, architecture photography, that sort of thing. After detail, I'm gonna jump all the way down to color calibration. I just did a video on color calibration, which I'll link at the end of the video. But to summarize, color calibration is basically color science. You can kind of think of them as really large hue and saturation adjustments. For a lot of people, this is a way to stylize your photo. In my case with this photo, I want more green and maybe a little bit more blue out of it. You can see if I go all the way to the left, I'm adding yellow into my photo. And if I go all the way to the right, I'm gonna get it a little bit more green and moody. So that's kind of where I want this photo to live. So I'm just gonna leave that there. I'm gonna get a bit more blue as well. And of course you can saturate that and you can see I'm just getting more green and more blue out of this photo. Again, there's no right or wrong way to use color calibration. At the end of the day, it all comes down to your artistic interpretation and how you want your photo to look. At this point, I'm gonna go all the way back up to my basic adjustments and start editing highlights, shadows, blacks, and whites. You can kind of think of this as bringing more detail back into your photo. In my case, this photo is still very dark, so I'm gonna to wanna to raise the shadows a bit, maybe drop the highlights, and you can see right in the sun there and in the clouds, I'm recovering color because whereas before it was blown out because it was too white, now I can bring it back and my photo starts to look way more colorful. This all comes down to personal taste. If you look at my histogram, you can see that there's kind of some detail missing in the whites, and that's because drone cameras don't really have the best dynamic range. You can look at this photo and it kind of looks like there's a lot of white going on in the sun, when in reality, we're sitting at, you know, only about 80 or 90% white right there. In some cases, you may need to drag your whites all the way up so that you're getting, you know, a really dynamic range in your photo. But in this case, this is gonna work perfectly fine. Jumping down to the presence tab, I talked previously about not adjusting the contrast slider, and that's because texture, clarity, and dehaze are all versions of contrast, but they're smart contrast. You can think of dehaze as if you have a foggy photo and there's just not really a lot of contrast, or in this photo where the sun is kind of creating a little bit of haze, if I was to drag that up all the way, now all of a sudden I'm starting to recover a lot more contrast without affecting the fine details of the image. Now if I go all the way down to texture, texture is the opposite of that. And if I zoom in, let's take a look at these trees. If I raise the texture, all those leaves and details start to pop a lot more. One thing you have to be really careful of is if you drag this too much and your photo's like a night photo with lots of ISO noise, this can start to look really grainy. Now, some people love that look. In my case, I always love adding a little bit of texture. And then we get to clarity. Clarity is kind of like the joke in the room because it's that mid-level of contrast and everyone always does one of these like, slide it all the way and then your photo just starts to look really crazy. I actually tend to do the opposite, especially when I have both human subjects and landscapes. For human subjects, Clarity can do a really good job at softening skin tones. And for landscapes, it can really start to give you this magical hazy forest effect. In most of my photos that you'll see me post online, I will actually drop the Clarity a few points just to kind of bring out the magic in the photos if you wanna call it that. For vibrance and saturation, it's kind of the same thing. Saturation, if you drag it all the way, you know, that's a very rookie move of, oh my gosh, I just want the colors to look amazing. But what happens is the sky starts to look way too yellow and the trees look like broccoli and now we're pouring cheese whiz onto our landscape and that is just not what we want. So instead, I'm gonna grab the vibrance and what vibrance is, is it's a smart saturation. So it looks at your photo and says, 
where are the least saturated portions of your image and where are the most saturated. It takes the least and tries to bring it up to the same level as the most saturated. So in this case, that's gonna be all these trees down here. The sun and the sky look good. We don't need to worry about those. So typically I'll add a few points of vibrance just to kind of even out and make my photo look a bit smoother. Now the biggest change to our image typically comes with the tone curve. I did a whole video just on the tone curve because it's a bit hard to understand. And I'll be honest, when I first started using it, I didn't really understand what I was looking at. The parametric curve here, I will typically just ignore that one because it's not as flexible as the tone curve here. The tone curve is a great way to add localized contrast to either specific portions or specific colors within your image. Right now, we're gonna look just at the tone curve. I like to start with this medium contrast setting because it gives me some points that I can then push and pull depending on how I want my image to look. In this case, if I drag here, what it's actually doing is brightening the highlights and the whites. So if you look at this graph, it represents an input and an output point. An input is kind of where you're starting. So imagine we hover over and this white point here on the right, it's saying it's about 84%, 76%. And if I drag that up all the way, it will make that now to 90%. So it's a way for me to take a color that's in my image and either brighten it or darken it. So whereas with the highlights, the shadows, and the blacks and the whites, those were kind of overall adjustments, the tone curve lets us get in and make really fine grain adjustments to certain portions of our image. So make the judgment call of how you want your image to look and go from there. Another way you can use this is to add a flat black or a matte look. So a typical edit you'll see people make is grab this point here and drag it to do something like that. Now what this has done is it's clipped out all of the blacks in the image. And you can see that right here in the histogram where there's no information there. But in this case, I wanna keep my blacks at true black. So I'm gonna undo that and drag that down a little bit and maybe drag this up a little bit. And I think that's where I want this image to be. For the next set of adjustments, the hue, saturation, and luminance are probably my favorite tab for really editing how your photo looks. In this case, I did want to go for a slightly more moody look, and usually that involves taking your greens and sliding them towards yellow, and your yellows and sliding those towards orange. So in this case, I think that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Now looking at saturation, I'm actually gonna drop the reds and the oranges a bit because I think my sky here is probably a bit too saturated still. Just to give you an idea of how these sliders affect your image, if you look at this river here, you'll see that there's a bit of blue. Now, if I grab my blue slider and desaturate that, you can see I'm only removing that specific color. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish off these adjustments and we'll jump to the next step. After this step, I really like to go back to the tone curve, massage it a little bit, but then really jump into the red, green and blue curves because it's a really good way to start adjusting the overall color of your image. Now this works great in combination with our next step, which is color grading. I will typically make curves adjustments before doing color grading because curves is typically more broad, whereas color grading is really specific if you wanna add back a certain color once you're done. So I'll typically add a few points, start to play with it to really see what I can get and the great thing about Lightroom is that it shows you right in the curves what you're gonna get. So if I take this point and drag it up, I'm gonna get more red in the shadows or in the darker tones because that's on the left side of the tone curve. If I drag it down, I'm gonna get more teal, again, because we're on the left side of that tone curve. If I jump to green and start adding points, you can see that we're also doing something very similar. If we want more magenta in the shadows, for example, we can drag that point down, or if we want less magenta in the highlights, we can drag that point down or move it up. But if you really wanna get the most out of your tone curve, I recommend checking out the videos that I'll link at the end and in the cards at the side. Now at this point, most of our adjustments are done and you may be looking at it going, well, it doesn't look anything like the original photo you showed. And that's because there are still a ton of adjustments to be made under the masking tab. For example, I could come in here, I could grab a gradient filter, maybe add a bit of saturation, and then come in here and start brushing on some darker areas. So if I grab this brush and I say drop the exposure and I start going like this and then even accentuating these hills here by adding some additional shadows on the shadow side, you can see how very quickly I start to make this photo look way more dramatic. 
All the adjustments that we made previously, whether to shadows, to highlights, to temperature, to saturation, you know, we can come in here and like right now I'm brushing on a little bit of color temperature just to make the center of the photo look more warm and draw attention to it. But there really is no limit in the way you can use this feature. So I highly encourage you to get in, maybe apply some gradient vignettes or darken certain portions of your image because it can take a photo that was good and really make it look great. If we go back to talking about contrast, another way I like to use this is to actually add clarity, but to just specific portions of the image. Whereas before we were just applying clarity to everything, I could come in here and start to brush on clarity and maybe some texture and maybe some white to the sides of the hills to really get them to look like the sun is shining through and is a, is a lot stronger than it actually is. And if I toggle O, you can actually have that overlay shown and it just shows you where the opacity is and the areas that you've already brushed. You can see, for example, with this radio filter, if I just raise the clarity, it starts to make it look like there's way more sunshine in the valley than there actually was. And it's a really great way to just add more drama and more light and more intensity and more character to your image. And so after all the adjustments, all of the masking, and everything, we go from looking like this to looking like this. And you can see it's a pretty dramatic effect that makes the photo look way more moody. It really brings out the shadows and really brings out those details on the trees and brings emphasis to our subject, which is the river in the middle of our photo. Now, of course, if we compare that to the original photo I posted on Instagram, that's what that one looked like. So maybe it's a bit brighter, maybe a bit more less green. So you tell me which version of this photo did you like better? The one that was posted on Instagram or the one we edited just now? Of course, they're gonna be slightly different because every time you go through that process, there are slight tweaks and new features that you find that you might wanna use slightly different. If there was any feature in this video that you thought you wanted more information on, I'm gonna post a whole bunch at the end of the video and in the cards so that you can check those out. If there's something you want more information on, or if you like the types of videos where I go in depth on one photo from start to finish and show you all the features, make sure you let me know. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. That tells YouTube that you felt this video was worth watching so that it recommends it to other people. And until next time, take care.